All right. We are uh, picking up in uh, participants. Welcome, uh, people. We'll uh, wait for some time to let people uh, join into the uh, to the links. Uh, I can add some some practical information uh, in the meanwhile. So if you've uh, joined uh, joined in via the um, browser you'll have some a limited experience in terms of being able to participate in polls or asking questions. So if you want to, to have the full experience, we suggest you uh, rejoin the, uh, the link and then download the Zoom app. How are you, Hannah? I'm good, thank you. Um, it's Friday. And my, my kids have been uh, sick, so they've been uh, home from preschool and school, and now they're back. So uh, I've had oh. the time to just work and catch up a bit. So I'm, I'm feeling okay. How are you? That's nice. I'm good. I'm good. I'm actually down in Sarajevo, Bosnia, uh, right now to um, I'm visiting um, two things. I'm visiting our, we have part of the tech team working here in Sarajevo. Uh, but I'm also doing a TED Talk uh, on Saturday, tomorrow. Oh, so, exciting. Good luck on that. Uh, you will have to hit me up with the link after so I can watch you talk. Of course. Of course, I will. Um, right. Let's, uh, let's get started with uh, the second webinar for, uh, for this series with Hannah Jamali. So welcome to the second, uh, the second where it's the War on Cancer Psychologist Sessions, we call it. Uh, and these will take place on a monthly basis. And for each episode, we'll be discussing a part or specific topics related to mental health. So for this specific uh, event, we're gonna be talking about the fear of the unknown. Uh, of course, it's a wide, uh, wide thing to, uh, to discuss. So in order to get some kind of context, uh, what I'm thinking we should discuss is first of all, the fear of death, uh, which is for many people very imminent when going through cancer, uh, but also for people that have gone through cancer uh, in the past and have, are now so-called survivors and sort of the fear of relapse. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to introduce you again, Hannah, to, to the audience for new uh, newcomers and new listeners. So Hannah is a licensed psychologist and or organizational consultant specializing in crisis management on an individual as well as organizational level. Uh, with over 12 years of clinical experience and also having met with many cancer patients throughout her uh, professional work. Uh, again, some practical information. If you joined by the War on Cancer uh, via the browser, um, you might uh, have a limited experience in terms of not being able to participate in polls. And uh, to uh, so, if you want the full experience, rejoin via the Zoom app. Uh, we've received a couple of questions. Thanks so much for that. Uh, we'll be covering them later on. But also, if you feel like you have questions you want to ask, feel free to shoot them out and we'll try to address, address them as well. Uh, and I'd like to actually start with sending out a poll to understand where we are with this question. So I'm launching it right now. And it says, on a scale from one to five, with five being the most, how strongly have you felt the fear of the unknown during or after cancer? Hmm. A lot of people. Interesting. 24 out of 29 so far. And it's weighing down uh, on the towards the four and the five. Not too surprising. Um, I'll leave a few more minutes or a few more seconds, I guess. Yeah, we'll leave it there. Uh, and here we are. I'll share the results with you. As you can see, uh, 
more than 50% of the respondents have put in five. So there's many of you who are, uh, have experienced a lot of fear of the unknown during our after cancer treatment. Thank you for participating. Before we dive into the questions, I'll just sort of add my personal experience with fear. Uh, having gone through cancer, I'm now it's six years since I was diagnosed. I have numerous, I, I think I personally would vote three on, on the same scale because um, I don't, I mean, due to the fact that I have really taken this opportunity of going through cancer, this horrible experience that it is uh, to, to experience a cancer treatment and, and, and I've really tried my best to work with this as, as a way to grow personally. I think through that experience, a lot of my fear has been reduced, but I, I would lie if I didn't, didn't say it, that whenever I feel tired, oh, not whenever I feel tired, but when I, when, whenever I feel tired for a longer period of time, that, or, you know, I feel under the weather for too long, that question um, starts to, to arise within me. Like, what if it has come back? Maybe I should go to the doctor. Maybe I should go and check it out. And I have numerous times uh, in those instances, contacted my doctors to, to ask those specific questions. It's turned out it's always been a false alarm, but mm -hmm. that's as far as it goes from, from my experience as a survivor. I remember when going through cancer that I was pretty, I felt quite certain that I was going to survive. Um, I was told that I had about 60 to 70% chance of surviving. And from where I came, uh, where I was in my state of mind, I, I sort of really put my mind there um, saying, you know, I'm going to be amongst, it's sort of, it's, it's an overweighing probability that I will survive this. So I would have to be really unlucky not to survive. Uh, and I, I, I really sort of, I became resilient in that feeling. Uh, so I would say that the more I've been more afraid after having survived right. of the right. rest than the fear of death. But I'm, of course, my it's my individual experience. So now to you, uh, or sorry. Uh, well, no, no, uh, that's really interesting, Fabian, because you're, what you're saying is that that's my individual experience. But I would say my experience as a psychologist is that what, what you experience is quite common um, in the sense that we talked about the topic is the fear of the unknown. And I would say just to go back to that, the one thing we do know as humans is that, that there is quite quickly we understand there's a beginning and there's an end. But when you've been through something like that, like a cancer diagnosis, everything becomes time becomes more present. Uh, like you said, um, if I can connect to what you said about go if feeling that you've been better and then when life comes back somehow, you get the fear again. Uh, and and uh, it almost sounds like uh, from time to time that you you were analyzing your body and, and trying to see, well, because could this be a sign of a relapse? I'm feeling really yeah. tired. Uh, and that creates some kind of worry and anxiety within you that grows. And I would say that uh, that experience is very common, uh, at least when it comes to all the patients I've met. Um, the fear of, you know, the, the symptoms being something else than just being tired. And I, I really like here what you're saying about I mean, coming from a beginning and the end and realizing this, it's almost like what you're saying to one extent is how we should be living, right? Because ultimately, we're if there's one thing that's certain is that we're all going to die. Mm. So what what you're saying is then that perhaps, I, I mean, or or I mean, 
I, I've started to reflect a lot more on about death after after going through cancer. And for me, I feel that it's led to me actually appreciating appreciating life a lot more. But at the same time, I get this fear of dying. Yeah. Is that is that something you've noticed as well? Definitely. Uh, because on one hand, when you're not knowing that is one thing, having the fact that I know I'm living right now and someday I'm gonna die. Uh, yeah. because it's so abstract somehow you still give yourself the opportunity of thinking about how you would like your life to be whilst for many people when you get a diagnosis what happens is everything becomes really present and you start thinking about can I really do all of the, those things that I've dreamt about in life and, um, and maybe you you will ask yourself even bigger questions like, will my partner stay with me? Uh, what about my kids? Uh, how, how should I talk to them about life and death? And, and things you might not reflect on as much when you're healthy or when you're not sick. Uh, yeah. So it's exactly like you said. I mean, if you can use that um, in a way, of, and we're gonna talk about uh, that a bit later on, but if you can, can use that, uh, uh, thing that experience of being more present instead that will be really helpful and and people a lot of people I've met also say that they feel that life is a more meaningful after yeah. their, their diagnosis than before so um, yeah but what also I mean if we still I'd, I'd like to sort of deep dive a bit more into why do we fear the unknown because it's not I don't think it's the full answer to say that just because we become aware of the fact that we're going to die. Yeah. It's, it must also, I think, or what I feel relate to the fact that we're trying to control everything so much yeah. as human beings. Definitely. Where we're trying to control what is ultimately uncontrollable, which is life, right? And, and I think you're pointing on something really important here. When we don't have a diagnosis, I think we feel that we have more control than we do. Uh, and that's the main difference. Uh, when you think you have more control, you, you don't think about the uh, existential questions as much and they might not hinder you as much either. Um, but at the same time, when you get a diagnosis, you might feel that you want to live life to the fullest. And I think that's why a lot of the patients I've met say, well, I feel a lot more present, even though I even I have more anxiety than I did before. I also feel that I can be more present and I can enjoy things in a different way. And, and that we know as well, that feelings are quite odd in that sense, because joy can a lot of the time trigger sadness and sadness can trigger joy. And they're quite, quite interlinked. I mean, uh, some of my patients um, say, I can be in this moment and I can be really happy having dinner with my closest friends and family. And all of a sudden I think about death uh, and that I don't know what life will be in a week or two when I start my treatment again. And that makes me really sad in that moment when I'm enjoying uh, being there with my family and that's usually when i say that that only shows how normal you are because we are yeah. the, the questions are really i mean the feelings and thoughts are really linked to each other when you yeah. appreciate something you fear losing it so that's how we work so almost, almost sort of almost letting go of control uh, is I mean, it comes with a price that you get to experience both the good things and the bad things, I guess. Yes. Uh, and the bad things is the fact that you realize that you might actually die, but at the same time, you can be present and actually enjoy the moment instead of just trying to kind of constantly project a future that you that is futile for you to be projecting. Yes. Exactly. And I, I, um, a lot of my patients have always uh, has always said that. Um, they also get this overwhelming feeling of their feelings. So sometimes when they feel joy, they really feel joy or yeah. when they feel anxiety, it's almost like they're paralyzed by it. So, yeah. and that is something they don't really recognize from before the diagnosis either, that being in these ex extreme feelings. Uh, uh, and that's obviously something new for a lot of people as well. And uh, the life before and after cancer. Yeah. 
But why bring it back further? Why do we want control? What's, why, why do we feel like we have to control everything? Um, because life is so unpredictable. I think it's a way for people to try to categorize and, and, and make things easier. Uh, we know, for instance, that people who have a lot of ex help me, existential thoughts, <laughs> uh, they, they, they can experience a lot of meaning, but they can also experience uh, fear, a lot of fear, because they don't know what the right answer is. And I usually say we can go back to kids and how they organize their everyday life. And, uh, and they really, a lot of children want things to be in order and they want to know what happens in the next step because then it becomes overwhelming and as adults we learn to understand complexity in a different way and we can handle more of that but too much complexity becomes too hard even for us as adults so I think it's a way of just being able to live your everyday life and uh, try to be a bit organized in everything that's going on and control uh, is somehow we think is a way of doing that. I'm a huge fan of uh, looking back to the caveman days for to understand our own behavior and it seems like the people who are more fearful and wanting to control everything were probably more prone to survive yes. than uh, the our ancestors who were more sort of like easy go lucky you know just float around and just see what happens because back then life was harsh in a way it's not so I guess we have we share a lot of the sort of genetical composition of those who were more prone towards fear yeah. and wanted to control things. So we also, also, I think we need to keep in mind that we're working, if we want to become more free, we're working against generations of more fearful people that, and, and that lives in our blood as well. You're completely right. We're actually working against our, our brain because our brain is wired to be in control and try to uh, look up negative situations and be proactive uh, and a lot of things in life you can control and that's when our brain usually uh, gives the things that anxiety as a way of trying to keep us and keep us safe uh, so you're absolutely right cool let's move it in towards cancer a bit more now we've been flowing around the philosophical uh part of for a bit so I mean, what are the most common pattern, patterns you see in, in patients who fear a cancer relapse? Uh, we say so you were touching upon it, but if you want to sort of elaborate a bit more, so sort of let's, yeah. if you can just talk about your experience a bit yeah. with, with, with cancer patients and survivors. Uh, I would say that the biggest fear is, is not really when you're in treatment in the sense that uh, you're having a lot of symptoms and feeling sick. Uh, a lot of my patients have said that during that period, you're just coping and trying to survive the everyday. So those thoughts are not that present then. It's more in the moments when you're feeling healthy or when you're feeling that you're getting your life back or when you're starting to dream about the future or what you would like to do. That's usually when the fear also kicks in. Um, and it's like we talked about before that when you have something that you find meaningful or that matter to you, you're also afraid of losing that. So it's, it's like the same situation with the dinner and enjoying that and at the same time getting scared that you will lose that or never have that again. Uh, so it's the same kind of patterns you can see there. So usually a lot of uh, my patients even say, when I'm in my sickest moments, I'm, I'm actually quite active because I know what I need to do to survive in that situation. I know what I should think about when it comes to food or um, just you know surviving, having the energy to take a shower or all of those things. But when I have a bit more freedom and when I have a bit more space and time, that's when it hits me. So what is life going to be now after this? What if I actually get to have my life back again? Uh, what would I like to do? And that usually comes with a great amount of fear and sometimes anxiety. 
just bringing it back to my own experience, I wonder when I've been most fearful. I would, hmm, I, I would, I would say when in times when I felt the most fearful uh, have been times when I've been the most stressed. Mm. I uh, wouldn't really be able to relate to sort of like when things are going well that I get more feel fearful then, but rather, yeah, you know, it feels almost like a downward spiral sometimes in life when you get really stressed, uh, you, you know, your sleep gets worsened and then you start to cut your, the amount of time you exercise on a weekly basis. And then all these things lead to more stress and then you might get sick or feel down. And then, you know, in that moment when you're, you know, in a, not a good mental health yeah. Uh, state of mind that's where the fear creeps in at least for me yeah uh, and, and that's common too uh, because when you've had the experience of fear or anxiety uh, usually when you have other feelings that usually triggers that so because you've had the experience of real fear and the fear of the unknown uh, things that are quite similar to those feelings can trigger those thoughts because that's how our brain is wired. So uh, something that's similar to something else get interlinked. And that's usually why I tell my patients to make sure that you have the basics, that you get your sleep, that you eat okay, uh, because Sometimes even feelings of hunger and tiredness can trigger anxiety as well, because our brain kind of gets those feelings mixed up. So it's just a way of uh, taking care of yourself, making sure that you have your routines as a way of helping yourself to handle when you get fearful or when you have anxiety. I guess we're kind of moving in towards sort of advice here tips coping um and uh, i mean was that it in terms of your advice or how do you normally no i would really say start? the biggest two i would say i have two big tips to give away um, and uh, the first one is uh, when you are feeling this fear of the unknown usually what happens is you feel stressed like you said and and you also feel a lot of anxiety and for some people you can even go towards depression and what you tend to do in that situation is that you want to um, a lot of people isolate themselves and what you would, what is good to do in that situation is instead of going into yourself is to go out of yourself. So uh, what I usually recommend is that you have a piece of pen and paper and you write those fears down. So yeah. what are my fears? And what you try to do then is to be present with what is going on in your body when you are writing these things down. Because usually when we, we feel that we're frightened or that we have anxiety, we do a lot of things to avoid those feelings. And what you're doing now is by vis visualizing them, you're actually exposing yourself to those feelings. So that is one thing, to write them down and see what happens to you. Another thing is to ask yourself the question, so what am I not doing because I'm scared? because I have this fear in my body. What are the things in life um, I've stopped doing that I know is important to me or things that I would like to do that I'm not doing because of fear? And the point of that is not to do them and then confront your fear or uh, uh, get your fear to go away. That's not the point. The point of that is to do the things that you want to do even though you have fear inside of you. Uh, and that's the way of being. And when you do things like that, you become more confident. And a lot of patients I have say that they feel proud of themselves. And those feelings are really important when it comes to uh, fear and anxiety. Having It almost becomes like an anecdote against those uh, feelings because when you feel proud uh, of yeah. yourself, uh, you can also manage and handle the cost of being frightened. Nice. Um, what I wonder is, could we take it up a notch and say, can you learn to love the unknown? How would you, how, if I came to you and said, I want to learn to just love the fact that everything ultimately is uncontrollable anyways 
And I understand that life happens the way it happens. What if I can, how can I, how do I learn to just fly and flow with that experience? And you can learn that by uh, exposing yourself. That is the best way. And like I said, um, the way of being, doing all of those things and not controlling is not to get your fear to go away, is to live with the fear. It's a big difference between those two. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that if, if you want that, uh, you would get to know your fear and get to know your feelings and not a way of controlling them, just a way of just letting them be there with you while you're on your journey. So be scared and, and do things that matter. And, and I would say, um, I mean, I, I have a lot of patients who say that as well, who say, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I love risks. And especially when it comes to my patients who have traveled a lot or who've been doing like risk sports, et cetera, they have that within them somehow. So um, a lot of those patients actually see it as a challenge and a way of, and getting to know life via this fear. So yeah. I would absolutely recommend that. It's a good way of at least being curious about what is going on there. How much do you think trust plays? I mean, I, let, me, let me sort of, how much, first of all, have you experienced a difference when it comes to going through cancer from a faith-based point of view? As in, you know, if, if, if you think that, you know, there's a, there's a purpose for you going through this right now, you're supposed to be learning some things. Have you experienced, I mean, I know we're living in Sweden, which is perhaps not the most sort of faithful or faith-based country, but have you noticed any differences there? We do know when we look to research that some faith can be helpful. I mean, a lot of people say that uh, faith can be helpful uh, and maybe that's a way of like you said trusting uh, something trusting that uh, this is not in my hands and it's in someone else's hands uh, but I would also say that people that practice uh, some kind of mindfulness or at least the here and now practice uh, of being yeah. present like, like we talked about before uh, they have the same experience so it's more about not letting and uh, these extreme feelings control you. It's more about letting yourself, telling yourself, what do I want uh, to be my compass in life? And how can I live with the capacity I have? I mean, if you're sick and you have a diagnosis that, it, that hinders you from doing a lot of things that matter to you, you can tell yourself, what can I do with the capacity I have? And we know that if you activate that and try to live by that, you're more prone to uh, having better mental health than if you don't. I can definitely see that. And I mean, if, I'm just gonna go, go back to my experience here and, and, and sort of, and I th I'm sure some listeners will relate to it and, and others won't, but I, uh, when I was diagnosed, um, I, uh, I didn't have much time because I know one of the most common questions is, you know, why? Like, mm. Why was I diagnosed? Why me out of all people? Um, I never had really had the time to, to um, think about that in that sense because I pretty quickly felt, and I, it was probably my mind that made it so for me as a, perhaps a survival instinct, but I felt, I, I felt it like uh, I tried to see a lot of, I, I felt a lot of purpose in my journey going through cancer. Mm -hmm. I felt that I was diagnosed um, because I was living a very, my, my life before cancer, I wasn't being very good to myself from the mental health point of view. I'm not saying that cancer came there as, as in a way to sort of rescue me, but it, I looked at it upon it as a, a learning experience for myself. Um, and also I took the opportunity whilst going through cancer to try and help others, which of course gave me even more sense of purpose. So for me, that was what's created the, the, the journey of war and cancer. Um, have you discovered or in your, 
have you discovered the question why when you're we're talking with patients and sort of what, what have been your experiences when you talk to them about this? Uh, I would say that not so much about the why, but more of a um, sorrow that you uh, that you're not on the same path as everyone else. Maybe more of I wouldn't say bitterness, but more of a sadness that could turn into bitterness if you're not careful. So, yeah. um, so, so n no, not not the why so much. Um, really, I have I haven't really heard so much about that yeah. I understand mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a very it's a profound question I guess why do, do people why do things happen to you and why does not I just personally found it it's it's really helped me to to whenever I feel I felt really down or sad I felt that is it was well it happened to me so I guess because it happened it should happen uh, I was, and uh, because of that, I'm supposed to learn something from it. And sort of, I've, I've, I've really learned through the years to lean into that experience. And, you know, uh, it, it's whenever it's been really tough for me, it's helped me a lot. So call it faith-based or call it sort of, sort of just uh, the act of nothing is random. Uh, that, that idea that there's always sort of nothing is really random but things do happen for, for some reason. Uh, we don't, might not always know the reason. You're, you're also talking about something very important and it's, uh, it's about behaviors that you've uh, been active and doing things. And uh, especially when it comes to certain things, you said you, you lean towards more meaningful things and also you wanted to do things for others. And we know that when it comes to well-being, that we're, and uh, we feel a lot better and more meaning in our lives when we do things for others. Um, and that can also be helpful. I know uh, a lot of my patients also say that sometimes because I, I feel so focused on myself because, uh, because of uh, my cancer and, and I and try to analyze my body and my symptoms and everything, it's sometimes really helpful for, for me to be out with my friends and focus on them and how they're feeling and really being present with them and taking in their perspective. And, and they also say that that's something really helpful when it comes to their own mental health. Uh, and I think because we are social beings, that is also th something that's quite important when it comes to our mental health, that if you go in too much in, in yourself as an individual, you and you lose that uh, quality of being with others and being present and caring for others, uh, then you also lose a bit of uh, the things that will help you in this situation. Hmm. Altruistic happiness. It's the only thing that's proven to make a person happy with um, significance. All other things are just illusions. Isn't that so? So um, interesting. I, I like where this conversation is going, and and um, I wonder. I mean, you keep coming back to presence. Presence seems to be sort of the question, the answer to 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 a lot of things when it comes to mental health. Can you elaborate a bit on what is it? What is? I mean. Perhaps some people don't really know what presence means. And secondly, why is it so good to be in presence? Yeah, good question. And really, um, how do you get into presence? How you get into presence, yeah. yeah. Um, and I usually say that everything we do are behaviors. Even when we think that we're not doing things, we are doing things. Uh, so even when you think you're just sitting there looking at me you're probably you know it, it takes a bit of effort looking at me or when you're ruminating and you're thinking about your thoughts you're also actively doing something you're going into yourself and you're analyzing your thoughts something that takes a lot of energy and time from you so being present is the same thing but what happens because you were, you were talking about that earlier on, that how our brain is wired to look for uh, negative things. Um, and I would say that it's the same thing when it comes to presence. We're not able to be present all of the time because that would go against how we're built. 
we're built to look for danger. So if we're present all the time, a bus can hit us and we can die. So that's not a good thing. But to actively tell yourself that I'm going to be present now for as long as I can, that's a good thing. Um, when I'm having my coffee here while I'm talking to you for 10 minutes, I can do everything that I can to try to be present. And that would be to actively do things that will make me present, like looking at you, asking questions, nodding when you're talking. Uh, when, when I realize that my brain is somewhere else, I actively take it back. Mm -hmm. When I'm thinking about what I'm having for dinner later on, etc., I tell my brain, okay, so I noticed that, let's go back to our conversation. And you can't do that all of the time. That's a really big pressure to have on yourself. But if you can try to train that and say, I'm going to do it for 10 minutes while I'm having this conversation, that's actually quite good. And then my mind can scatter and that's completely fine. Um, but that's the, that's the way of training your presence. Great. Um, we should have a whole uh, whole episode, I guess, on on uh, on that topic. Um, but great, uh, great way of uh, presenting it. A uh, couple of questions from the audience here. Yeah. Uh, first of all, how to deal with the very feared scan anxiety? How to? Sorry, I didn't catch that. How, how do you? How does one deal with scan anxiety? So scan anxiety. Uh, anxiety before yeah. going to a scan or before seeing yeah. the results of a scan. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I would say it's exposure, uh, like we talked about before, and usually when when anxiety works the way that it's a build up. So what happens is usually when you have a lot of anxiety for a situation, it's because you've probably put a lot of energy and time and thinking about how it could go wrong or things like that. So the actual situation, a lot of people say, is not as hard as they thought. Um, but the buildup towards that situation is a lot harder. So I would say the same thing that we talked about earlier, that if you know, write those things down and vis visualize them and also talk about your fear. And when you're talking about it, try to tell your friends and family to not to calm, calm you down, but to be with you in the fear. So yeah. instead of saying, you know, everything will be fine, you will be okay all of these really nice things that people say and do around you to be uh, loving, uh, that can actually be counterproductive. So what happens is what you do instead is in that instant, you lower your anxiety, but in the long run, you actually stabilize your anxiety uh, because that's how anxiety works. So what you need to do is to, when you expose yourself, your anxiety actually goes up, 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 and what you have to do there is try to be present with your anxiety because then you will realize that it will go down or at least you will find tools to handle your anxiety. So one thing would be write it down, expose yourself. And during the time you are exposing yourself to different situations linked to the scan, uh, make sure that you have everything you need to be able to handle that anxiety. So sleep yeah. well, eat well and do things that matter to you. But then you can also say every day for like an hour, I will sit down and visualize this and I will wake my anxiety as a way of getting to know how my anxiety works. How, how good it is, is, how important is community as in being in touch with others who are going through the same thing uh, with regards to dealing with both anxiety, but I guess fear of the unknown in general. We are social people and we need each other's experiences. So being a part of a community is a very good way of handling that, to share your thoughts and, and get perspective from other people in that situation. I would say that's priceless. Yeah, yeah I fully agree. Um, how do you continue to live the life you have rather than worry about the life you may not have? 
from uh, Stephanie, one of the, in the audience. Good, Stephanie. I would say the most important thing is to not blame yourself when you're in that situation and you're thinking about the life that you could not have or that you didn't have. I think it's important to grieve as well. So uh, we've talked a lot about curiosity and being present, which are really important things, but it's also important to be able to grieve and be sad about what you feel that you might be missing out on. Uh, and if you don't, uh, you might deny yourself a part that really wants to be heard. So I would say, take your time, make sure that you grieve, but do it at the same, um, do both things. So grieve, but also do things that you can do and that you would like to do with the capa capacity you have. And also perhaps uh, approach or embrace the idea of change because I mean, change is constant. I mean, you, I don't have the same life that I had yesterday. Yeah. Something's changed. Yeah. My, my relationships has changed. My friends are different. Uh, things might happen. There might be a war somewhere. Things change everywhere and things change within yourself. You're aging. So, yeah. I mean, going back to what was, I mean, I feel, I feel that from my, I'm just giving my personal experience here. I've learned to sort of cherish, uh, cherish change more. Uh, and more. Uh, and I mean, I used to be also a person that sort of had my ways very set and I had my yeah. sort of, this is my projection. I have my three month, four month, five year plan. This is what I'm going to be doing. And I realized that that made, that took a lot of energy mm. uh, <laughs> to be constantly planning like that instead of just realizing that, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, yeah. And I'm saying this, of course, as a survivor of cancer. So it's, it's. Um, I, I guess it's really depends on where you are in the cancer journey, and it's sort of. I think uh, ultimately, what I felt for a long time when I was diagnosed was that I also wanted to go back to my own life. And I and I think what you're saying right now is really important because somehow when things happen, all kind of crises really. Uh, people think that uh, life would have been linear, and uh, I mean, you would you would live the way you thought you would live, and whilst exactly like you said, things change all of the time. You don't know how your life would be, but what what you do know if you have a diagnosis is that you definitely know that things happen that you then made this change very present for you. And what can you do to be able to handle that in the now? Um, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a good thing to, to, to train, but not always uh, easy to maintain. No, of course. A uh, few uh, more questions here. Thank you everybody for sending in questions. This is great. So from Amelia, uh, I'm nearing the end of active treatment. Do you think moments like that are possible, possibly trigger moments? Could I feel worried then? What can people do to minimize worries uh, uh, at moments like that? Yeah, I would say I, I don't I don't know because it's very individual. So I don't know how how you would feel, but I think that there's definitely a risk of feeling worried in that situation. Uh, and sometimes, again, we we talked about the being present or being curious, and those are really important things. I would also say, just let yourself worry in that situation. I mean, you're worried, so worry. It's okay. Um, you don't have to fix it. You don't have to change it. If it makes you restless, be restless. Uh, and be yeah. kind to yourself in that situation. Ask yourself, now that I'm so worried, what do I need? What would be helpful for me? Not in the way of getting the worry to go away, just what would I need? Exactly like you would, uh, if a friend of yours is feeling sad, you would probably give them a text or call them or send them chocolate or uh, talk to them. Uh, ask yourself, what would I need now that I'm worried? And tell your uh, friends and family that now that I'm going into this situation, I will feel worried. What would be helpful would probably be yeah. these things. And if you don't know, say that. I don't know what I will need. I don't know what, what my reactions will be. Uh, 
but I think I might be worried in this situation. Communicating your fears and your needs, that's something we all, you know, with a little help from my friends, uh, as well as the community. I mean, for, for those of you who are fearful, feel free, or I hope that you're all members of the War on Cancer app. There are, there are many people that have gone through what you're going through and can relate uh, and ask those, uh, those questions in there as well. I'm sure many in the community will be able to help out with their tips and advice as well on, on how, how they've dealt with fear. And with this, we're going to come to a conclusion here. Um, it's been really great uh, chatting with you. Super, super happy about, I mean, we went deep into things and I, and I hope the audience that you have uh, enjoyed what you've heard uh, as well. Of course, we're learning as we go. So feel free to send in more feedback uh, to us, uh, things that we can improve upon. Uh, the next webinar is going to happen a month from now on the 7th of June at 1 p.m. UK time and uh, 2 p.m. Swedish time. And we'll be covering uh, the, the, the topic of coping as a loved one or a coworker or a friend. So if you have any other topics that, I mean, we have our planned kind of uh, path for, for this whole year, but if you have any topics you feel we should cover, feel free to send them to hello at waroncancer.com or do connect with us in the War on Cancer app. I go under the hashtag or at username at Fabian Bolin. Um, with that, I thank you for your time and uh, see you in a month. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Bye.